breaking news. It is significant. It is the story we've been talking about all day, Manchester United. So, someone has emerged from the pack as the possible next manager. Tell us. Well, one of the leading candidates who we've been talking about today for the United job is the sporting manager, Ruben Amorim. And in the last few minutes, we've been able to confirm that Manchester United are in talks with him. Now, this is a development that was first reported this evening by David Ornstein in The Athletic. Now, Ruben Amorim is a young manager who's doing a great job at sporting. Lots of other clubs have been interested in pointing him as well. For instance, he was linked with the West Ham job, the Liverpool job. There has even been talk that he is a potential Manchester City manager one day. But we can confirm this evening that United definitely are in talks with him. All right, so why him? What is it about Amarin? that has attracted them? Well, just have a look at the Portuguese league table at the moment. I think Sporting have got a 100% uh, record. They've won all their games. They're six, seven points clear at the top. They won the title under Amarim last season as well. He is one of the best young coaches in European football at the moment. And it's not just United who have been interested in signing him. Now, one of the stumbling blocks I would have thought to this deal being done is the fact that he's got this release clause in his contract. Uh, Sporting actually had to pay a big, big release clause by Portuguese league standards uh, to get him, and his contract has got a release clause of about €10 million Euros in it. Now, if you think about the fact that United need to comply with the Premier League's uh, profitability and sustainability rules, they also have to factor in the fact that they need to pay off uh, Eric Ten Hag. Who's so just had a new contract. Well, an extension. Mm. So there's talk that they may have to pay him something in the region of £15 million. Now, Amarim has got a release clause, I think, of around €10 million. Euros. Mm. So United would need to spend not just to sack Eric Ten Hag, but also to bring in Ruben Amarim. Look, he's a very exciting uh, young coach, plays brilliant football, but some critics and detractors will say, OK, all well and good, but what he's achieved has been over a very short period of time in Portuguese football. And with all due respect, Portuguese football, of course, look at all the brilliant Portuguese managers and players uh, in the Premier League and all over European football, the level of the Portuguese league is not quite at the level of some of the other big leagues in European football. But then look at all the brilliant... Uh, Portuguese managers. It looks like Ruben Amarim could be the next big Portuguese manager and United are in talks with right. him. Right. 10 to 12, Ten Hag was sacked. We've just gone past 10 to 7 in the evening. Does this mean United had a plan all along? <laughs> so you are saying that this was all lined up, that they had somebody else uh, teed up and then once that was all sorted, they told Eric Ten Hag, see you later, because with someone else Yeah, because it's a in. weird weekend to do it when United were so unlucky and played so well in the first half and got a dodgy penalty given against them at the end of the game. OK, I don't have concrete information that that is what has happened, but what I can tell you is that all clubs have succession plans in place. We also know that during the summer, United were talking to other managers. We know over the past couple of weeks that they have been sounding out other candidates. And for instance, my colleague at Sky Germany, Florian Plettenberg, he has been reporting that contact, contrary, concrete contact, was made with Amrim's camp over the past two or five weeks from Manchester United. So I think there's an element of truth in what you say. That's just the way football works. OK, so if United get this guy, how long will he get before the honeymoon period is over? Because United seem to have smaller windows than other clubs. I think whoever comes in to Manchester United, their objective will be to get United in the top four at the end of this season. That's a long way away. That was the objective for Eric Ten Hag. That will be the objective for Ruben Amarim or whoever uh, takes over. United are not expecting to win the title anytime soon. It's going to take a while, a couple of years at least. Uh, they've got a uh, target to win it, I think, in 2028 and the 150th uh, year anniversary. Amarim, I think on paper, looks the real deal. He looks like a brilliant young head coach and also the pedigree of clubs who've been trying to get him as well. Clubs like Liverpool, for instance, being linked with uh, the Manchester City job as well means that you're a very, very good uh, manager. 
But if United get him, it will be a big, big coup. But I think he will have a lot to prove because a lot of very, very good managers have got the United job and have not been able to follow up on the success that Sir Alex Ferguson had. Boy, the way the game ebbed and flowed and having got back at 2-2, that they might have gone on to win it. Yeah, well, you thought the, the momentum was with them towards the end and obviously they were uh, on the front foot. But when you're 2-1 down, and we, we know how, how good Arsenal are, particularly defensively, I think Liverpool certainly would be more satisfied with the draw, maybe more so than Arsenal. A lot of talk in the, the build-up to this game about the number of injuries that Arsenal have had, which, which Virgil van Dijk's obviously, obviously heard about and, and referenced then. He's right. I mean, Arsenal weren't missing many of their starting players today. But like I alluded to at the start of the game, this was an opportunity for Liverpool to show exactly what they're made of. And what I found dis disappointing like you was the lack of the intensity when they had Arsenal on the ropes. Arsenal were dropping back. They allowed the pressure. They're quite happy to sit in and take the 2-1 because of they are now rigid in some, certain ways. And that's the bit I don't want Arsenal to lose, is that freedom when they are winning to put teams to the sword. They just didn't quite do that. Didn't do enough to win the game today. But Liverpool as well, the same, same sort of story for themselves. It's, uh, he's put in a lot of sweat into that performance, hasn't he? Having been out of action for a long time, you've, you've almost from the Liverpool perspective, Jamie, feared his threat against Andy Robertson before the game. Yeah, I, I, I felt the full-back positions uh, for both teams could be, potentially be a problem and Liverpool's fared worse than, than Arsenal's. But listen... Andy Robertson's doing all he can. I'm talking about one of the best right-sided players in European football. And as a defender, you look at it, can you do better? But he is amazing. And that is a brilliant goal. To control that through the legs, so sharp. And then to give the goalkeeper the eyes, lift it high into the net. Listen, we're talking about Virgil van Dijk. I mean, if I'm being honest, I think it's... It's more Andy Robertson than Virgil van Dijk. I like to see Virgil van Dijk sprint back but how quick he gets the shot. I mean, I'm not sure Van Dijk would have got back, but he'd been a lot closer. Of course, he would have been if he just sprinted back. But I just think the situation now, he was actually looking to see where the strikers were, maybe for a pullback. But I think when you're probably playing against a player like Saka, you've probably got to double up. And Andy Robertson needs a lot more help, not just in that situation, but throughout the game. I think just your instinct with Van Dijk there, when it does go over his head, is always, as we say, particularly for defenders, expect to watch, expect him to come back in. But again, he's just ambling back. I, I just think when it goes over your head and scrunched, your, your instinct is to sprint. He's not sprinting. And Robinson's got to do better. He, obviously, he gets cut out here, which is fine. You have a chance to make up for it by saying he's not going to get back inside, which he does. Bit of skill, brilliant. Van Dijk's got, I think he's still got to sprint. You've got to recognise danger, haven't you, yeah, as a defender? Like, expect you moved pretty quickly the other week, the other day, didn't you? Like sprinting. In the mascot yes, suit. <laughs> but I want to see like yeah. people. There's a lot of players switching off at this Expect, moment. You know expecting someone else to do Expect their job. Expect the for worst them. always. I've exactly. seen Van Dyke in a Liverpool shirt now. I've only been there for six or seven years. I probably think I can count on one hand how many times I've seen him sprint. <laughs> he, he plays the game sort of in sort of slow motion where he moves. He always seems to get there, but but at times that's probably the one thing you could sort of say to him. Some, now and again, could he have a little bit more intensity? And if you feel at the other side, Canate was. Helping oh, out amazing. Trent Alexander-Arnold quite a lot in the game. Canate was fantastic, honestly. He was Liverpool's best player by a mile. How, how much he stopped down that side, coming across. And probably that situation we're talking about, Canate's natural reaction is to get across. He's probably told it's going to happen a lot more because you've got Trent on that side. He goes into midfield. So he's, he's actually picked and was bought for Liverpool because he was playing behind Trent Alexander-Arnold. He almost finds himself as a centre-back and a right-back at times in the game. Well, let's have a moment of appreciation for Bukayo Saka. Yeah, you heard the statistic there about him being uh, the fastest, uh, so the youngest. To oh, there we are. Ah, Theo, he's edged you by just the three years. Only three years. <laughs> Goodness but, me. Okay. But there, there is the phenomenon because I mean, okay, you started young, but others did as well. This is a young man who delivers consistently over and over again to the point that at 23, is it is it far fetched to say? If he plays, do you think Arsenal have got a chance in a game? I think, yeah, without a question, but I think the disappointment, you can feel that in his interview there. I think he wanted more players to get up the field with him and he couldn't really express himself like he did in the first half. Most of the Arsenal set-up, I would say. So that would be the only disappointment on my side of it, but for him, Arsenal was such a better team when he's in it because he causes all sorts of problems for everyone and it's, it's, it's without question. All the, all the brilliant players affect games and that's what he does. Again, when you're watching it, there's no surprise when, you're see, when you see him doing that, that level of skill, the finish. I think his, his kind of interview, what I came across there was, I, suppose he, I got the impression he was disappointed of your 2-1 up, your Arsenal home. And I, I, I'm starting to worry about this. 
Arsenal mentality now. You're two one up, and I'm still looking. Go, go, go on and try and win the game. But there's elements of Arsenal now, and, and it's, it's happened most of the season when they get themselves in front. I never don't mind the excuses about injuries or another ten men. They all seem to sit back in as if we're setting up for two one. We try and get something on a set piece instead of going. I'm go, go and get the third goal because Liverpool were there for the take, and if they wanted to go for it, but it was almost. Let, let's hope we can win two one. And then when you're up against good players like Salah, then they're good enough to punish you. We'll, we'll come to that and we will develop that point, Royal, a little bit later on. Um, it was a tale of two set pieces then before half-time. First, uh, Liverpool striking through Virgil van Dijk. How has this worked, Jamie? <laughs> Listen, it was definitely a plan to try and find Luis Diaz in that front space. Trent tried it on nearly a free kick. And Kai Havertz normally is so good for Arsenal in that front space. And he's been done now two weeks running. The goal at Bournemouth, the first goal. And you see, he's got his eye and he just switches off. And he doesn't see Luis Diaz coming. And listen, it can happen. You know, someone gets across you, but they'd be disappointed. We know they're the set piece masters, Arsenal in the league, so much talking about it, but they've been done twice now in two weeks, and it's cost them. I mean, the disruption, it could have gone off anyone. You know, it, you know it's obviously happened to be Virgil van Dijk, but it can, generally could have been a goal. You put into a ball into a good area, obviously, Trent, we understand those quality. But yeah, you know, that's what's one of those Arsenal good at and they've been punished today with one of those. It, it did seem to be a bit of a problem in the first half, particularly for Liverpool on their left-hand side, defending against Bukayo Saka. They were giving away uh, free kicks, sometimes really w <laughs> without too much threat of danger. And this was the first one that came Mikel Marino's way. And perhaps on another day, that is one that, that you would expect to nestle in the back of the net for you. Yeah, I would. Uh, I mean, it's one of those he's probably been put off by his own player, but that was the warning. But again, brilliant set piece, great delivery, and you just need to guide it, it just needs to hit you. But The setup's interesting, isn't the, it, from us? Yeah, the danger is there already, but we could see it coming. We could see it coming. It's obviously just on side, but. The question is always, are they like going that? to get back on side in time when they're doing the little train that's at what, the back? That's, that's what it is. It's block the Liverpool players and just hope your player obviously gets on the end of it and someone's just playing you on side. It was Virgil van Dijk's, I think, left foot. But what I would say is we, we, oh, we can see, as I mentioned, the Virgil van Dijk, a blue boot there, the left foot plays, plays uh, Moreno on side. But there's a lot now with set piece coaches. And we, we highlighted the situation with the, the Bournemouth set piece coach and how much of an impact he had on the Arsenal goal last week. You see, this sometimes the set piece came, you know, coach came out for Arsenal, they're almost celebrating. That's just a great delivery. That's got nothing to do with a set piece coach. That is unbelievable delivery from Declan Rice putting it in the area. So that's, that's yeah, but never would you changed. you say that's the timing of, he wants the timing. So he's, even from the run up itself, there's a lot of thought that goes into it as well with set pieces. Oh, as well. of course. The it's one of those you don't the back just post. do. Like, I mean, but probably yourself would have done it just the day before a few set pieces. But they do it every day, so mm. it's just repetition. It's like with strikers. Well, you, can shooting, all, you can have all the movement repetition. that you want, but if the ball obviously Deliberate. has been. It does help. But we're watching here, and you watch any game at any level of football, when someone puts a good ball in, you do look and go, oh, you're in trouble here. Mm. No yeah. matter how well Liverpool might have lined up, and there's so much pace in it, any connection, it's going to go in the back of the net. So, did you expect Roy Arsenal to go on and score the, the next goal in the game? Well, yeah, I thought that I, I thought they had the, the, the momentum with them, and the, obviously the home team. You're thinking, yeah, go on. Do you know what? I, I, I'm looking for Arsenal to go on, to go and win the game, but it, it, almost they didn't believe in themselves. And again, this is it. Trent. I question Trent's defensive stuff, but in terms of his passing, my goodness, what a pass that was! Salah, amazing. So I'd be more a good player from Liverpool, but I was still worried about Arsenal's mentality about going on to win the game, as if they were maybe hoping. But what a ball that is! What a ball! Nunes does well here because he wants to pass it and he yeah. always falls over. But yeah. Mo Salah, another goal, 163rd goal in the Premier League, I think, for Liverpool. Level now with Robbie Fowler. And he's obviously going to go past them between now and the end of the season. But Nunes, that's what you want, yeah. using his pace. And it, it looks an easy finish, but he puts it it's right great. in the corner. It's beautiful, isn't it, from yeah. Trent Alexander-Arnold? And we talk about the game of football, but again, lads, isn't it? When you, people are running in behind... Nobody wants that, do they? When you're defending, and the right way to pass the court, yeah, beautiful finish. There. It's one of those dis disruptions of obviously yeah. the, the players that come on. You know, yeah, yeah, they had Lewis an Skelly came on, Kivio came on, and there was a bit of confusion for themselves. You got to again recognise danger. Salah exposing Kivio space, it's a problem straight away, and they should recognise it. And so maybe that's especially when you see Trent done it. Yes, you know Trent's going to pick somebody out if he's got time. One major talking point before the final whistle and that uh, was, uh, I suppose you, you can half call it a disallowed goal, but the, 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 the whistle seems to go quite early in the build-up. You be the judge, Theo. OK, cheers. <laughs> <laughs> no, well, my, my issue here is, 
Anthony Taylor, who did, I think, a really good job today as well, especially in the second half when he let play play on. But here is an opportunity where he thought about Britain, as goes there, he brings his arm up once, and then he takes his time. And it's like he's given the foul for what? The first one, but it looks like he might be given for the second one. A bit of confusion, I think, for me, if you're a referee, you'd be a certain straight and you say it's a foul. So the foul's there. But you can see him just raise his arms. Oh, no, I'm not going to blow yet. Why, why do you think he now. just hesitated? Just to see if, if it would drop for Liverpool, who maybe muster a counter-attack but there's from no it? advantage in that 18-yard box for, for Liverpool at all. I think it is a foul. I do think it's a foul, but the issue for me is he goes to blow, waits, and this is where we're saying referees be decisive, make decision. Look, you can still see he's not blowing the whistle. Is he giving it for Kai Havitz's one there, or is the first one? We're not quite sure. But I do still feel it's a foul. Just the confusion of when yeah, he blows yeah. for me. I agree, yeah. It, just, it seemed to take too long to, to blow the whistle, which didn't help the confusion. Uh, Liverpool were beaten here in February 3-1 by Arsenal. Is this evidence, Jamie, that, that Liverpool are getting better under this manager? Well, listen, Liverpool were in the title race. and I think Liverpool were top of the league. I think they're probably six or seven games to go. There's still a long way to go to see if Liverpool are in that position. So I, I wouldn't say the better. I'd say the difference. They're certainly better defensively when you look at the numbers sort of, you know, this season. I think Liverpool came here twice last season, once in the FA Cup. Won here, I think, 2-0, but got absolutely battered in the first half. Arsenal should have won the game. Arsenal beat them, I think, in the league 3-1. So, you know, created a lot of chances. That wasn't the uh, sort of the game that we watched today. And that's probably something a little bit around Arsenal and where they're going, and we maybe get to that uh, shortly. But, uh, but from Liverpool's point of view, the big change this season is defensively. They look a, a solid unit. Well, I think this season they've been the best defensively in the Premier League, and that, that's a big difference from what we saw last season. Do you think being better defensively, Broy, is more likely to take you to the big prizes? Yeah, of course. Well, you have to, you have to, have to defend properly, and you know with people like Salah, you've always got a chance of scoring goals. There's definitely a calmness to Liverpool, even. And obviously, that comes from the manager. He speaks very well. And even when they were 2 1 down today, there was, they didn't seem to panic. Obviously, a lot of belief, and that would come from confidence of winning football matches. I know we'll argue all day about you obviously have they been really tested yet, but they've, they've turned up. But the one really big disappointment, I suppose, the Forest game, when they got beaten at home, which we know can happen if you're not at your best. But generally speaking, they look a strong, efficient team. And you got world class players like Salah, and you have a chance to win football matches. And remember, they were missing their goalkeeper. Keller has done well in the last month or two, so they've had their one or two setbacks as well with injuries themselves. We've obviously been discussing Arsenal for last week about all their problems, but Arsenal had one or two players missing. I mean, Liverpool had one or two players missing, but they've turned up today, and again, the manager said that a couple of weeks ago, and they keep turning up. That gives you a chance to win a football matches. I, I think Alex Ferguson always says you can, you, can, you can see the personality of a manager in his team. So we, we saw that for seven years with Klopp. Mm. Klopp is just this big, huge personality, energetic, and that was the team. When you see Arne Schlott interviewed, it's just calm, reserved. You know, it doesn't get sort of too carried away, you know, whether you're winning or losing. And as Roy just said, that you see it on the pitch. It's a lot more controlled, Liverpool, so it's not end-to-end. -end. They're not having to deal with counter-attacks as much. And that's why they're better defensively. I don't think it's necessarily that he's a defensive manager or he's brought in better... Are you all right there? Sorry, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't see it. I'm really wrong. Well <laughs> <laughs> I, I just wanted to ask yourself, actually, do you, do you feel like they miss that clock intensity at times when they really want to go for the game? Because, I've, like I was saying, at times they just lack that intensity. Do you think, well, like you say, with the calmness? Listen, of Klopp? every manager has to balance between the defence and attack. So that that intensity that we're talking about, Jurgen Klopp, and might may, maybe create more chances and, and lift the crowd more at Anfield. But what you lose is maybe going the other way. Mm. This is maybe not as much going the other way pressing really high, winning the ball back, lifting the crowd, all the big atmosphere. But you're better defensively. Just trying, that's what it's about, trying do, to get Do you the think, balance. Theo, that dressing rooms respond in a different way to those different kind of emotive managers, whether it is the, the, sort of the tub-thumping of Jurgen Klopp or the, the quiet calmness of Arno Slav? Yeah, I, I've got to agree. The teams are a reflection of, of managers at times, and we're, we're seeing a different side of Mikel Arteta in this moment in time from an Arsenal perspective, where we want to keep hold of what we've got and be defensive-minded. And I'm just worried that we're going to lose that flow, free flowing sort of football that Arsenal have known for doing from the Arsenal Wenger era. And, you know, when I, even when I was playing as well, don't go away from what you're good at. And what Arsenal are good at at times is dominating higher up the field. And I just don't want them to get into habits of holding on to things when they can put teams to the sword, particularly when the likes of Liverpool are challenging because they are definitely here to stay. That's well, well, I, don't, I don't think they're getting into bad habits. I think that's an instruction for the manager. This has been going on now, I would say, for about 12 months. We're, what? We're, coming, we're going to come to that in oh, a minute. Oh, come on. <laughs> okay. Because I want to hear from Mikel Arteta. Sorry. Uh, having been tested 
uh, for the first time today. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> it's the bottom line from this, Theo, that it was absolutely imperative that Arsenal got something, effectively didn't lose the game. Yeah, I, I mean, he talks about courage there, Mikel, and yeah, I, I totally agree the fact that they, they need to start playing with that sort of freedom, that courage, but I wouldn't be too decided right now. They've, they've played a lot of these teams right now, particularly away from home, that are challenging or, or spoken about. Challenging City, the Villa and Spurs already. There we go, so big, big teams already in a difficult moment with a lot of players missing. Today, yes, they had some players missing, but they still had a very strong team. And I think, like he says, he's just disappointed that they just want a little bit more. But look, I wouldn't be wary right now to sit in quite happily in third. And it's, it's one of those where it's all positive, I feel, with obviously the players coming back. That's always good signs, Bikaya. And that's what Arsenal are about right now. Could you actually spin this, Roy? Yes, there have been problems keeping 11 players on the field. Three times that's happened. Three times they dropped points before this afternoon. Could you, could you spin it as a positive that given the, the, the stature of some of the players they're missing, like Erdegaard, their most creative player, to be where they are through this period is actually a positive. Yeah, well, there, there is positives. There's, there's certainly... Um, they're not going to panic. They'll be, they'll be disappointed with some of the results, and obviously that was self-inflicted with some of the sending-offs, etc. But I'm still looking at some of, the, some of their performances and the positions they've got themselves in, and that was today. So whatever circumstances, they end up 2-1 up at home to Liverpool, and Liverpool didn't look at their very, very best, did there was an element of, of calmness to Liverpool, I suppose. So, I'm, again, I'm looking at Arsenal. A bit like when the City recently, and I'm not saying these games are easy, far from it. But it's not meant to be easy. It's not, it's not meant to be easy to, 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 to win big titles. But I still look at this mental, mentality of this Arsenal group. Today, when you're watching them live, and they're 2-1 up, and whatever the, the circumstances, injuries, go, but can you go on and, and not take silly gambles? But you're the home team, take the initiative. And I always feel with this Arsenal, particularly today, when we're 2-1 up, yeah, we just... And we'd step back. And I, I really worry for the Arsenal. Forget about the players, the medical staff. Because every, every time a play, an Arsenal player's tackled, they're going down, they're rolling around. They're time-wasting. And they're trying to kill the game. I get it about that. But you're the home team, you're 2-1 up. Use the initiative, use the fans behind you. Because the fans were doing their best to, to get them over the line today. And this is if... I just worry about that belief and that mentality where you're going... I don't, do they really have that belief and conviction that they're a top team and they can really challenge Man City? I still don't see it. I think they've made great progress and it's, it seems really, I suppose, critical, but you have to look at it when you compare them to Man City, where Man City have got to the last few years. But could they actually look back at the end of the season, at this period, and say, this is what took us to the title because of the way we managed to navigate a difficult time in the season? Of course they can, and, and, and that uh, remains to be seen, but... I think the interesting thing when, when you were watching Arsenal, and it's not just this season, I've been thinking about this for a long time now, probably going back to this fixture last season, I think it was end of January, early February, and because Mikel Arteta worked with Pep Guardiola, we're almost thinking this is a, a Pep Guardiola disciple. And if you look at the best, probably the two most successful managers, let's say, the last 10, 15 years, you've got Pep Guardiola here with a certain style of football, and you've got Jose Mourinho, almost equally as successful at the other end. Mikel Arteta is slowly morphing into a Jose Mourinho type of manager and no-one really thought that would happen. And I just think it's really interesting how they've got there. So, you see today, 2-1 up, pressing in Liverpool, on top of Liverpool, playing really well. They retreat second half. Now, I know they had a couple of injuries at the back, but they've still got the midfield players playing, they've still got some attacking players playing, who you think, can you get on the ball? Can you go forward and try and sort of maybe take the sting out of you know, the pressure you're under? So, there's a... So, you think that instinct, Jamie, is protecting what you that, have that's rather from the manager. trying to win it? It happens too often now. We see it with ten men. I get what happened at City. I thought what they did at City was brilliant. I, 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 I commentate on the game, enjoyed watching it. But what they did here against Brighton, what they were doing against Bournemouth last week, the, t the top teams I've seen before down with 10 men, I go back to my own experience as well, but, yeah, you're under pressure, but you relieve it, you keep the ball a bit more, you're still a threat going forward. And it, it feels very, when they were down to 10 men, like what Jose was like in the new Camp with Inter Milan. And, again, this is not a criticism, this is an observation of where Arsenal are as a team, and it's going back almost 12 months. And maybe it's the fact that Mikel Arteta looks at his attacking players and thinks... We're not as good as Man City, and they're not. We've got to win the league by being the best team defensively, and that's what they were last season. And I think possibly they still are right now. They just lost goals because they've been down to ten men in certain games. But this idea that Arsenal played great football, he's a Pep Guardiola man. He's not. You see that, as Roy said, with players going down. 
the secrecy before the game about who was fit, who was not fit. It's all out of the Jose Mourinho playbook. Does it matter the style that you use, Theo? If sorry, you are sorry, going to go sorry. and win the title, does, it, does style matter in terms of delivering trophies, the biggest trophies, ending this long wait for a Premier League title? I mean, and that's the you hit the nail on the head there. The long wait, the Arsenal fans that have waited for something, and if they're going to win it in the Jose Mourinho way, he was very successful. I think they will take that. I really generally think they will. But like I say, don't shy away from what you're good at as well. But of course, it's all about the trophies in the end of it. You'll be remembered for that. Jose Mourinho is obviously saying very successful, winning in a certain way of style. Why could you not do both? I think they can do both. They showed it in the first half and the second half at times. It's just, I feel like right now, Arsenal are going through a, a sticky patch, but still getting results. Liverpool, we're talking about them challenging, and it's all sort of roses with slot right now. But they didn't win here today. They still managed to get a result, yeah, against a depleted Arsenal team towards the back of the end of the game. So, for me, I still feel like it's a positive sort of outlet for Arsenal. Right? No, I, but when I you're trying to win the title from Man City, though, it's, you're talking about styles, and I've played for managers, and I think all the great managers are gamblers. They do go and want to win games, and they'll sacrifice losing the odd game. But I'm seeing with this Arsenal group, there's still the element of even everyone sitting and going, no, we'll take like, the draw today. Instead of sitting there going, we were 2 on up. Nobody got to back 2 2. We should have got, try and get the momentum back in the game and try and win the game. There's an element of, we'll put it this way, too many draws won't win you any title. Yeah. Do you think you're comparing them to the great? You're comparing to a brilliant Man City team. Yeah, but do you think they can sacrifice playing against a Liverpool team? They maybe can sacrifice playing against a Brighton. Obviously, they're down to ten men, but a Liverpool team who are expected to be there at the end of the season. Hey, I'm not quite sure. But we're, 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 I'm not being critical of it. I'm just saying it's, it, it, this idea that he, he's all of like Pep Guardiola. He's not because you know we we have seen Roy's right. You think of sort of Pep Guardiola right now. You think of Jurgen Klopp. You think of Sir Alex Ferguson. But Jose Mourinho won a title. Claudio Ranieri won a title by being tough to beat. So it's not a criticism, it's just this is what they are as a team. Let's not kid ourselves that this is the most exciting team that we've ever seen in our lives. This is a team who want to keep clean sheets, back themselves to keep clean sheets, score from set pieces. I mean, they're one of the top teams who actually see go longer. Lot. And again, I'm not against that. It, it, it's refreshing that not every team plays the same way. But when I'm watching Arsenal at times, he's not scared to just go long and not take any chances around the back. But, to, but, it, but again, but not, not criticising the style. If, if they're sat in today and they were saying, listen, we're up against it, we got injured, and they win the game 2 1, then you have to give them praise. You've got, they got over the line. Man City, a few weeks ago, they got loads of praise, but they're a 2 1 up and down. Yeah. But they end up not getting the three points. And you're so, against... do you, what I'm saying is, Roy, I think the probably question is, do you think they can win the league playing like that? No, but the, the, the evidence is just they can't because they don't seem to be good enough to. You have, you have to win these type of games, especially when you're in front. Again, there's games again with the Man City. Every game obviously is different, but when you go down to it, when you go two one up against Man City and you're down to ten men, yeah, I get all that. Don't get me wrong, but you still and this is a compliment to Arsenal. People think you're having a critic, you're critical of them, but you're going because I, th I think you can be better than that. This idea of sitting back in and we're watching the game live here, and I see players going down. I see them really, and you're two one up at home. You're going, no, you, you've got the momentum. You go and get the third goal against Liverpool. We know Liverpool are no mopes, obviously. But it's almost gone, we'll really slow the game down. And you know what? We'll hand the initiative back to Liverpool. And when you've got people like Trent in possession and Salah, well, trust me, they, they will punish you. It, it felt like second half that Arsenal the man sent off. That's what it felt like. We, we said that yeah, earlier when we were watching the game. Liverpool was so like... I don't think Liverpool were amazing creating chances, by the way. But to allow another team... You know, you are still Arsenal at home, 2-1 in front. You've been brilliant first half. You, you know Liverpool are going to come back in the game. That happens in, in all the games. But to allow them to be so dominant... I, I, no, I'd be frustrated as an Arsenal supporter watching that second Do you feel half. like Liverpool... Sorry, do you feel like Arsenal can drop any more points? Yeah, listen, yeah, listen, but listen there's a long way to go. Of course, mm. they can drop a few more points, but... Four points is, is manageable Man City. I they think lost five is... and drew five last season, yeah, for I example. Mean, listen, you put pressure on yourself, you fall behind Man City at any time. I, I sense that you think Manchester, you've got Manchester City here still uh, a bit on a pedestal compared to the rest. Yeah, at this moment in time, yeah. So which of these two would you would think finish above the other? Oh. Based on the evidence of the first nine games of the season? I want to say Liverpool. But there's still obviously question marks over Liverpool. We, I gave Liverpool loads of uh, praise last year. And they ran out of steam with five, six games to go. So obviously there's big challenges for Liverpool ahead. But with that maybe control, with that maybe calmness to their group of players, maybe that will help them in the long run in terms of injuries and the way they look after themselves and deal with the extra games might, might help them. But I've been wrong before. <laughs> <laughs> but at this moment in time, I would say the way I, I, I would have Liverpool over Arsenal. Yeah. Interesting. I mean, like I, I said at the start of the show, Liverpool have only faced 
United and obviously Arsenal today, Chelsea, I feel... Chelsea, Leipzig. AC <laughs> 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 Milan, Arsenal. <laughs> Again. <laughs> it was the their road to the viaduct. <laughs> Chelsea were not classed to being winning the league at the start of the year, considering they finished sixth last year. Maybe they have spoken about this year. Have Liverpool got to play Man City away for everyone to say that they've played someone? Is, is that what we're waiting for? We're waiting when for. is the date of that I game? That's what we're waiting for. Couple of weeks, first of December. December. You praised Arsenal while they go for beat, having some tough games by beating Spurs. Do you know what I mean? Is there, are you putting that in the bracket of a tough game? I am, definitely, particularly away from home. Uh, I think Arsenal at the moment in time have played teams, away from home particularly, and still managed to get a result. And that's the difference, I say, compared to Liverpool at this moment. But you have to play half your games away from home, don't you? Your league. <laughs> <laughs> and then I believe how it works is you also play them at home. <laughs> uh, before we finish, just a word on Liverpool. And uh, they have a few issues of their own coming up, we, we asked Virgil about one of them again, these contract situations with Mo Salah, I know you spoke about last week, Trent Alexander-Arnold being another one. And it was really interesting, the interview that he did this week uh, with Harriet Pryor, um, our Sky colleague. Uh, and and it, was a, it was a bit of a card game. He was asked to choose some cards and, and which one would he, would he like to achieve? And, and there were a few cards there. One of them was the Ballon d'Or, winning the Ballon d'Or. This is Trent. This is Trent Alexander-Arnold. And that was the card he went for. He said, I want to win the Ballon d'Or. I want to be the first fullback to win the Ballon d'Or. Do you like hearing that kind of ambition from a young man? I mean, I've got no problems with the ambition of players, but you've got to be realistic in the era and the generation that we're playing with. If all these forward players, your, your Drew Benningham's, your Vinicius Juniors, yeah. there's a lot of players and the clubs they're playing for as well, the Real Madrid's who win Champions Leagues after Champions Leagues. I think this moment in time, he's not at that level because defensively, like I said at the start of the game, is where I will feel he will be tested. Martinelli, we're not saying Martinelli's a Vinicius junior. He's, Martinelli's a very good player, but he caused problems. And that's why he's talking about Canate coming over, helping yeah. Trent. I think if you're Ballon d'Or, you don't need help. But he's I, a different I, kind so, of fullback, isn't he? He's a yeah. unique fullback. I know, yeah. but he won't be winning out of Liverpool, will he? Well, that's like I suppose that's the, question. that's the point. Does he need to leave Liverpool? Maybe that's to, his to message that that he's, he's, he's obviously under the other duck. Hmm. Yeah, his contract's that's up. It. I don't know if there's been. Talks. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't, I don't care about him. He can, he can, he can try and win the Ballon d'Or. Nothing wrong with ambition. But my first thought when I read that was, you're not winning the Ballon d'Or. A ride back for Liverpool. Why? He, well, Ballon d'Or winners normally play for Real Madrid or Barcelona. The best with the best players in the world go. And if, if that's his ultimate ambition, I think he was asked about winning the Champions League, the World Cup, or win the Ballon d'Or. He chose the Ballon d'Or, which I think is a bit strange or bizarre. I think he's always picked the World Cup or the, or the Champions League as a team game. But yeah, he's got massive ambition himself, and why not? You only get one career. He, he is a unique fullback. He's absolutely amazing. You know, you see, yes, Liverpool back into the game today with the pass. But uh, the first thing that came to me when I read that interview was that. That makes me think he's going to Real Madrid. I actually think Virgil van Dijk and Mo Salah will stay. Um, I do believe that the, the longer it goes on with Trent, the more afraid he's going to move on. Yeah, Liverpool... And you can't begrudge him that. It's his no, contract. Do no, no, you have like... any advice for him, Roy, Sorry? at this stage? Any advice for him? Well, if he thinks that's the right option for him, go move. for it. <laughs> yeah, no, yeah, go for it. I always <laughs> felt like you regretted that you didn't do that. Um, yeah, but uh, different situations. Yeah. And I, uh... I'm a bit weird because obviously I'm finished. I'm, I, don't, I don't look back and use the word regret, but I think if I had the opportunity again, yeah, I'd, I'd say to any young player or player with a chance to go abroad and experience a new league and a new challenge, and his contract's running up, so he'll have great options, then yeah, why not go for it? He's been at Liverpool, he's been a good servant to him, he's played a lot of games, he's come up through as a young kid, local lad, and done well. And try something new, nothing wrong with that. If Liverpool win the league and make the final of the Champions League, is he a contender for the Ballon d'Or, though, would you say? You know, I just think there's something about Real Madrid. It is the biggest club in the world. You, you, you know, you, you think that, but you, you go back to being a local lad, and there will be a frustration from Liverpool supporters the longer this carries on, and if he doesn't sign a contract, because in the past you've had two players. One was Steve McManaman who went to Real Madrid, won two European Cups, but that wasn't a successful Liverpool team. You had Steven Gerrard, who the team I played in, we weren't one of the very best. We were a top four team, won cups, of course we did. But the frustration from Liverpool supporters with those two players, Steven Gerrard didn't move, McManaman did, but Liverpool weren't the best. When Trent's been a Liverpool player, Liverpool have been the best and very close to being the best every single season. So their reaction would be, well, if you're a local player and Liverpool are competing for the league and the Champions League every season, what more do you want? So, so there will be a frustration from Liverpool supporters if Trent does move on. Yeah, but I mean, they offer him a contract. Is, yeah, yeah they, but, but it's, it's what terms they're offering him. As well, Michael Owen, Michael Owen moved, didn't he? Many years ago to Real Madrid as well. well. Michael Owen moved and Steve McManaman moved, and they were two 
amazing players for Liverpool, but they're not thought of as amazing players by Liverpool supporters because they moved on. And that's one of the reasons why Steve... I haven't finished trend, it, it. But that's one of the reasons why Steven Gerrard is such a legend at the club and seen as the greatest ever player to play for the club because he stayed here for his whole career. So Lloyd, do you, Lloyd, do you yeah. think, has to come into it, right? Oh, so you want Lloyd to get yourself a dog? <laughs> 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 Mic drop. <laughs> <laughs> and that's from my own experience. Yes, yes, absolutely. It works both ways as well. <laughs> <laughs> Mikel Marino goal. Mikel Marino scores following a Declan Rice free kick. The goal is initially given on field, but after a lengthy VAR review for offside, it ultimately stands. FL analysis. The correct decision was reached, so you may wonder why this is even highlighted. However, the time taken for this decision was unnecessarily long and frustrating, especially when Van Dijk's foot clearly played Marino onside. While it's crucial to reach the correct call, the process must improve. The future implementation of semi-automated offsides should help streamline decisions. FL verdict, correct decision, goal stands. Disallowed goal by Gabriel Jesus. Anthony Taylor calls a foul by Jakob Kiwia on Dominic Sobaslai in the build-up to a late goal by Gabriel Jesus. The Premier League confirmed the foul attributed to the Polish defender. FL analysis, Taylor's decision here feels extremely soft, and what's particularly striking is how long it takes to call it. Taylor watches the play unfold, yet only whistles after Havertz has a clear chance on goal. If there truly was a foul, which there wasn't, VAR should have had authority to intervene here. Additionally, two key points, the aerial duel hits Havertz's arm, likely too high to matter, and it's Jesus, not Havertz, who eventually scores. However, had Taylor allowed the play to continue and permitted a potential post-play VAR check, a smoother outcome could have been reached. FL verdict, incorrect decision, no foul by Jakob Kiwia. Kostas Tsimikas final play corner call. In the last action of the match, Kostas Tsimikas boots the ball out, and a goal kick is awarded. FL analysis, a bewildering decision by the assistant referee, with a clear view of the play. The Greek defender makes at least one, if not two, touches before the ball crosses the boundary. FL verdict, corner kick should have been given.